Good evening, and welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater, home of public programs for the UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is Mark Quigley, John H. Mitchell Television Curator for the Archive. Thank you for joining us for Noir TV, Naked City, co-presented by the Film Noir Foundation. Woo. Before we begin, as a land-grant institution, the Film and Television Archive at UCLA would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gavrilino and Tongva peoples. We are humbled to do work in this community. We would like to thank all that made tonight's screening possible. Archive screenings in the Wilder are free, thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor, and we are grateful for their support. And tonight's screening was made possible by the John H. Mitchell Television Programming Endowment. Please give these tremendous supporters a round of applause. We are extremely fortunate to have two special guests with us tonight. First off is the King of Venus, Michael McGreevy. is an actor, producer, writer, and director with an illustrious decades-long career in film and television. And to read a complete list of his incredible credits would keep us here all night, so I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. His professional career began at age seven, appearing in The Girl Most Likely with Jane Powell, he has starred alongside Kirk Douglas, Robert Mitchum, Sally Field, David Niven, Richard Woodmark, and Lena Horne, just to name a few. For children of the 70s, he was immortalized, starring opposite Kurt Russell in a series of Disney movies, including The Computer Wore Tennis Shoes, and Now You See Him, Now You Don't, directed by archive friend Robert Butler. And on TV, he has appeared on shows ranging from Route 66 to Parks and Rec. His first professional writing assignment was a collaboration with his father, Emmy and WGA Laurel Award winner, John McCreevy, with on the telefilm, Ruby and Oswald. And Michael's writing, producing, and directing career includes The Waltons with Earl Hamner Jr., Palmerstown with Alex Haley and Norman Lear, TV's fame, and many, many others. And last but not least, Michael turns in a riveting performance tonight as the King of Venus in the ex excellent Naked City episode will screen first tonight. So thank you, Michael, for being here. <laughs> After Michael's episode screens, he will take the stage for your Q&A, moderated by our other esteemed guest, way in the back, film and television historian Alan K. Rohde. Alan is a charter director and treasurer of the Film Noir Foundation, spearheading the preservation and restoration of noir classics and obscurities. A documentarian and producer, he is also the author of Michael Curtiz, A Life in Film, and Charles McGraw, Film Noir Tough Guy. Alan is an invaluable friend and collaborator to the archives. Thank you, Alan, for being here. <laughs> Following the Q&A, there will be a brief intermission. Then stick around for our second episode of Naked City, starring icon Diane Carroll and uh, John Magna, who you might remember as Dill from To Kill a Mockingbird. And we'll also have a brief bonus feature courtesy of Jenny Matz and the Television Academy. And deep in the program, a commercial that Noir fans won't want to miss. So stick around for that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and label the episodes I've selected for screening tonight as Humanist Noir. Ahead of its time, Naked City remains a uniquely psychologically complex police drama, an approach cultivated by the series' extremely gifted story gurus. Future Academy Award winning winner Sterling Siliphant and future WGA Laurel Award recipient Howard Rodman. Mr. Rodman's sons, writers Howard and Adam, excellent writers in their own right, are with us tonight and thank you for joining us. This screening is a tribute to your father's work. <laughs> Lastly, both episodes we are viewing tonight were penned by writers that were blacklisted. Arnold Manoff, credited here under pseudonym Joel Carpenter, and Abram S. Gins and we honor them as well. There are eight, yeah. There are eight million stories in the Naked City. Mm -hmm. Here's one of them. Enjoy and stay seated for the Q&A directly after. There's so much to say about these programs. I could have stood up here and talked for an hour. I'm gonna let Alan and Michael do that. Um, but stick around and you won't regret it. Thank you. Those of you curious, I am auditioning as a stand-in for the remake of Lady of Shanghai playing the Everett Sloan part. <laughs> uh, Michael, that was great. Wasn't he terrific? Thank Remind you. me never to piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a tough guy. Uh, 
Uh, it's funny. It's taken me six years to get that applause for that performance. <laughs> uh, you know, when you do television and film, yeah, you never know. That's uh, right. That's right. Well, yeah. in this case, uh, it, it, it's such a it's such a good show, and it's, it was such a consequential show, uh, and. I know they did a lot of the interior supposedly over in Gold Medal Studios in the Bronx, which was used to be biographed by D.W. Griffith and Buster Keaton and all of that. But there were a lot of shots that were not that were in apartment no, buildings. No, we were in the Bowery. You, yeah. you were in the Bowery there. Yeah, for yeah. about four days. Wow. Yeah, and and uh, I think where the the rooftop stuff, most of it, mm -hmm. is where La Mama is now. On, oh uh, really? Yeah, on I think Fourth Street, East Fourth mm -hmm. Street, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so yeah, it it you it you really were in New York. Yeah, uh, that 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 whole atmosphere was wonderful, and for a kid from North Hollywood, uh, <laughs> it was a, a weird experience. Yeah. Uh, now was this was this a gig? You were pretty well established by this time. Was this a gig your agent got, or how did that work? I had done uh, a Route 66 mm -hmm. with uh, Herbie Leonard uh, and with the same director, David Lowell Rich, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I remember I was just called in to meet with Herb um, and Marion Doherty, who was a wonderful casting director. Mm -hmm on both uh, Naked, Naked City and Route 66. Mm -hmm. um, I was cast, uh, so I just had to meet with Herb, and uh, that was a, I, I remember that meeting. He was really a, a neat guy, uh, oh, yeah. and treated me uh, like all of these adults. I'll talk about that later, but um, they, uh, they, they treated me as an equal. You were an actor. Yeah, which yeah. was really unusual. As a, as a kid actor, I had always been sort of used to being, oh, good boy, you know. Uh, and Say uh, your lines, go to your room. Yeah, and all of these uh, adults in, in, in the Herb Leonard uh, atmosphere uh, treated you as an equal, uh, as did Jack Warden. Yeah. That, did you have any rehearsal, or did you just get the script and go right into that, which is kind I of read the script TV. on the plane. Uh, it had been, there had been quite a, a few rewrites, I guess. And uh, um, so I was given the final uh, script when I was flying to New York. Mm -hmm. And I can remember thinking, this is really damn good. <laughs> I was 12 years old, but I knew a good script when I read it. And uh, uh, that one line, Every actor uh, hopes for a line like, the king of Venus will take care of you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I remember thinking, this is going to be really good. I didn't know it was Jack Warden until I got there on the first oh, okay. day. And I had never, never met or worked with Jack before. And uh, that was uh, probably one of the best experiences of my life. Wow, really? Yeah, both professionally, because he was such a good, giving actor, and personally, he, uh, I really liked him. And, uh, well, he's, he seems like an impossible guy not to like. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the two characters, uh, uh, watching it again tonight, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's the, the Sinatra song, Here's to the Losers, you know, yeah. for me. Uh, these two losers being thrown together. And uh, and Jack knew that instinctively. Uh, and uh, the director was, you know, David and I had done Route 66. We did a Black Saddle uh, episode. We later did an arrest and trial together. I, I worked really well with David Lowell Rich. But Jack, a lot of that stuff was improvised. All the, the fighting. Right. And you really, I mean, that, that fight where he tied you up and gagged you, you guys were really into it. I mean, it well, was violent. Well, I remember that um, I was doing the fake fighting. Mm -hmm. 
And Jack said, kid, go after me. You know, and I said, well, I don't want to hurt you. <laughs> and, and he said, don't worry, you're not going to hurt me. And when we broke the lamp, that mm -hmm. was not planned. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. um, so they used that one tape because we did break the lamp. Uh, yeah, he, he was very, um, the whole thing with, with the fighting, he had been a boxer in mm -hmm. the service. Uh, yeah. So he really knew about that stuff. Well, he was, he was a tough kid from Newark, New Jersey. He, he, came up the, he came up the hard way. He saved my life. Uh, we were, here we were down in the Bowery, and I was walking from, I guess, the set uh, to the, uh, the trailers mm -hmm. uh, to change wardrobe. Well, I, no, I didn't really change wardrobe in this thing. But I was walking to the trailers, and some bum picked me up and was running off with me. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I, I, I was so shocked by it. I didn't, I didn't scream or, or do anything. Yeah. But he was running. He was running right past the trailers. And thank mm -hmm. God, Jack, Jack Warden came out and went. I don't think <laughs> this doesn't look right. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't in the script. <laughs> and he went and stopped the guy. Wow. Who dropped me, and ran off. Mm -hmm. So he actually, in real life, he mm -hmm. saved my life yeah. too. So. I, I, I also liked your scenes with Barbara Baxley. I mean, it was almost like, you know, at one point, are, are you your mom's analyst? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I well, mean, it, was, it, was, it was really good, and, and I think you two had something going special Well, it's going interesting. Um, my mom was there. My mom, my career, I, I only realized this years later, that I had one of the best directors... Uh, ever uh, living in my own home because she would rehearse with me the night before and mm -hmm. give me direction. And most of the time it was better direction than I ever got on, on the set. <laughs> uh, I hate to say that. But, uh, and she was there for that scene and I was not doing it well. And she went to David. We knew David well because we had worked together so right. much. So she knew David Low Rich too, and and she's John Rich's brother, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Yeah, John Rich, who did all the sitcoms, and yeah, uh, yeah that's a brother combination. And uh, she went to David and said, "Because David said, Mike, what's going on here? I had no idea how to play that scene because I didn't have a mother like that." Uh, and I, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. And she, she went to David and said, he's having trouble because he doesn't understand the relationship. Right. And being a good director, David uh, came to me and said, uh, this is someone who you love, but you don't trust. Very good. And that's why, and I'm watching, God, on the big screen is really fun to watch this stuff. Uh, it really worked, uh, but I had no idea <laughs> about that relationship. And of course, Barbara. The other problem was off camera. Mm -hmm. You know, I met her. She hugged me. She was this she sweet, sweet lady. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. And yeah. and then suddenly she's screaming at me and slapping me across the face. You know, uh, it was it was a. a a hard thing to adjust to for a 12 year old of you know? course yeah. of course yeah. well you did come up the hard way uh, oh, uh just the hard to, way, yeah. to, to, just to digress a little bit mike and i met many years ago when i was writing my book on charles mcgraw and i discovered that mike was in a movie in 58 or 59 the man in the net with alan ladd and charles mcgraw and so I reached out to Mike, and he told me, and uh, it sounded like one of the most horrible experiences <laughs> for a young kid to be given to the tender mercies of Michael Curtiz. Yeah. But another character actor, Charles McGraw, if I recall correctly, helped you in that. Very well. much so. Yeah. And, and uh, Charlie was uh, a sweet man, but I also watched Curtiz. I think I told you that Bully story. Him. Yeah. Totally destroy Charlie one, one yeah. day. Uh, 47 takes Ugh. and and he'd he'd cut uh, curtis would cut in the middle of the take and say cut we have to go again because charlie doesn't know his lines Ugh. or charlie can't act 
I mean, Curtis, as you well know, yeah. uh, you know, and I later go to UCLA the end, Film six. School, yeah. and I find out that this guy I hated um, uh, directed all my favorite films. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Adventures of Robin Hood, yeah. Casablanca, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the one with uh, Cagney. Uh, yeah. Angels with Dirty Faces, Yankee Doodle Dandy. Dandy yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, no, I did have... Uh, Michael Curtiz scared me so much that I, I actually vomited. Uh, and I think you put that in the book. Yeah, I did. I did. It was too good to leave out. Uh, uh, yeah, he was not my David Lowell Rich. At no, all. no, uh, not at all. He was a very um, mean man. And, yeah. Uh, and he was near the end, and he, had, he was sick and old and... Yeah, burned out yeah. and, and, and I all understand that. all that yeah but not then but now <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely yeah uh, but uh, you know um, uh, Bob Butler who we were uh, referencing earlier uh, here uh, oh. who was honored here uh, Great guy. said to me uh, one time because uh, I had said I want to direct someday and he said well the best piece of advice to give you is you don't have to yell yeah, and Bob Butler, the sets with Bob Butler, you didn't. You know, everybody was happy, and mm -hmm. we we did good work. Yeah, it's uh, it's a lot easier that. Yeah, way. and yeah. Mr. Curtis just sort of felt like he had to scream and yell at everybody. I, I never, even as yeah. a nine year old, uh, yeah. I didn't understand that. Yeah, did you have any interface with some of the regular cast members like uh, Horace McMahon and Balaver and well, with, uh, Paul, with Paul? Yeah, with with uh, Paul Burke, I had. Uh, we spent a couple days together uh, hanging out on the rooftop, and we had a couple scenes on the streets. And uh, I really liked Paul Burke. Um, again, he treated me as an equal and, and uh, uh, welcomed me to the set. Um, Mr. McMahon, I, I met, yeah. and Harry Belliver was his sweetheart. I remember yeah. him being very kind. Mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't really have any scenes with them. Sure. I had the one scene with Horace. Yeah. Uh, when we went to yeah. into the hole there, uh, yeah. but um, McMahon looked like a uh, New York pol uh, Police Department homicide. He was, he was sort of scary too. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. He, 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 uh, had, that, he, he uh, had that. But, look. but uh, Paul Burke was really nice, and uh, I mean, the main relationship I had obviously it was with, with Jack, Jack. Um, sure. because we did so yeah. much stuff together. Yeah. But uh, and that scene at the end. Uh, where he says, I'm not coming back. Uh, yeah. I can remember sort of feeling, that was one of the last things we shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was sort of real for me. It was like, I'm not going to see Jack again. <laughs> <laughs> you you, know, you it, felt it. it. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, funny. You felt yeah, it. You felt so, it. Uh, yeah, yeah. The other thing I noticed, and I just want to add, um, uh, the score. Uh, I yeah. mean, Nelson Riddle obviously yeah. wrote the, the original stuff, right? But uh, Gil Grew, I think, was his name. Yeah. Gil Grew, yeah, yeah, very, very good. He, he was. He had the the Mickey Mendavern little. Yeah, yeah. Da, 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 da. Well, he was he he was the for years he was the house orchestrator at RKO. Oh, really? And he he sometimes he got screen credit, but most of the time. He never got screen credit. So all of those RKO films like Out of the Past, Blood on the Moon, all of those, Gil Grau was the orchestrator for all wow. those things. And I guess, like so many other people of that era, he migrated into television and, and did his own composing, I guess, certainly Good. this episode. Really I mean, solid. I I, it's the one thing I noticed different watching it this time. Uh, yeah. The big screen helps, too. Yeah, uh, I'm, I've got to give credit to Jack Priestley too, um, the yeah. cinematographer. Uh, I mean, the black and white uh, oh, photography. Yeah. Well, th this is this is the noir look, and in fact, this show was nominated, I think, like thirteen Emmys, and it won, I think, three or four, and one of them were for Jack was Priestley Jack. for his cinematography. Yeah, but, he won. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this I is remember. what happened to the B film noir. It migrated into television. And he was very uh, economic with his lighting, and, and he was a New Yorker. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a couple conversations with Jack. He had his two sons working on the, uh, 
we were on the camera crew with oh, him, okay. which was Great. cool too. Uh, and uh, yeah, he he used very limited light. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was Gordon Willis before Gordon Willis. I mean, in terms of and mm -hmm. with black and white stuff, mm -hmm. and because you know here we are in a basement of, of some tenement building. Right. Yeah, right. How's he going to get light in there? You know, right. uh, yeah. and if you notice, it was uh, David Rich always did a lot of move. Uh, yeah, he moved move the camera. Yeah, he did. And he did move the camera. Yeah, and, and there was it was it, there was a lot of the dialogue, even with the time, was realistic. I love that little bit with the uh, the landlady and telling Paul Burke, "Hey, I, yeah, I want to know like who know my what. husband's <laughs> sick sick friend is." Well, you know, the, and it it, yeah. it was able to address that subject in an, an adult way yeah. and get under the censorship. A little I don't bit. know how much, like I, I said, I do remember. Uh, you know, it's sad that that uh, Manoff, uh, mm -hmm. Arnold Manoff, Arnie Manoff only gets a Joel Carpenter credit in this thing. It's the blacklist stuff yeah. again. But uh, I know I just did enough. I did a Rube 66 also. I, I just knew I could hear, and he was a good friend of my father's, uh, I could hear Sterling Sullivan. Uh, in the rewrites, uh, yeah. you know, and uh, oh, just Stirl that. Sterling and Howard Senior were and the were Howard the Rodman. The Rodman. Oh my God, Senior. great, great yeah. writers, yeah. Uh, great television, and yeah. then went on to do great films. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a funny story about Sterling and uh, Burt Leonard, who was a character, as you say. He started with the Adventures of Rin Tin Tin, <laughs> and Route 66 was actually a spinoff from a Naked City episode. Absolutely. So the first year was a half hour, and they had uh, James Franciscus and John McIntyre, and they were actually reprising the roles from the Naked the movie. City movie. Yeah. And then it went to an hour, and they, re they recast everybody. But uh, in the movie, I think... The uh, um, Mark Hellinger says at the end there are four million stories in the Naked City, <laughs> but by this time there were eight million. <laughs> so they changed it, and at one point when Sterling Siliphant, who wrote 32 of the first 39 episodes oh my in God. year one, he went to Leonard and he says, "There's eight million. St there's eight million stories in the Naked City. Can't we come up with one fucking story for this episode?" Because <laughs> he was having trouble. But uh, uh, you know, Sterling Siliphant, I mean, his he was amazingly good and amazingly prolific. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. And, and there was that group. They all came out of uh, the golden age, uh, including my father, John McGreevy. Uh, and there was a small group, and but they they just basically wrote m most of television in the sixties and seventies. And, yeah. and you know, a, a word on Artie Manoff. My uh, my late friend Mickey Knox knew Artie quite well. Oh, really? And um, he was married to Lee Grant, Lee Grant. and their daughter Dinah is, uh, Dina is is still in the business. But he. Um, uh, he he was a guy with a lot of principles and and did it well and like so many writers like Abe Polanski he just went to New York and kept on working using fronts and using pseudonyms yeah. and they unfortunately they had to do that. It was a terrible work. terrible it was, period it was, for all of us. But uh, actually, Dinah Manoff came in when I was uh, working on Fame at MGM. I was I crossed to the other side. I gave up acting and and became a writer and, and producer and directed a little bit. Uh, she actually sought me out. She was doing something on the lot and uh, knew uh, one of the actresses on on Fame, uh, Valerie Landsberg, and she came to my office and said, "You were in something my dad wrote." like that <laughs> and nice. I said really what and she said it was a naked city and I said oh my god um, and I didn't know mm -hmm. I thought Joel Carpenter had written that show oh, I didn't yeah. know it was because oh, yeah. uh, it wasn't until later that they were allowed to, to give the correct credit on the blacklisted oh, yeah. writers uh, well you know the same thing with directors when I first grew up and started watching movie I saw Top Cappy as a kid, and I thought Jules Dassin was some French director, you know? <laughs> I found that differently, particularly when we corresponded. <laughs> oh, wow. wow. But uh, anyway, your career, I mean, we could do uh, hours on 
all the don't do that to stuff. these people. I know, but uh, two 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 movies in particular. Uh, another movie you were in, Day of the Outlaw, with Robert Ryan, and you were up in God knows where in a bunch of snow. Bend, Oregon. Bend, yeah. Oregon, in a bunch of snow in and, January. Yeah, 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 and it was it was I was the only person that liked it because. Uh, I like snow, and I, <laughs> I had been... Uh, Not a lot in North Hollywood. As, as a little kid. No, as a little yeah. kid, I was in Connecticut. Oh, and okay. When we moved out here to California with my dad, um, because television moved out here, um, I missed the snow. So <laughs> suddenly I'm up there in Bend, Oregon, and the entire cast and crew is complaining about freezing their ass off, <laughs> and I'm loving every minute of it. Uh, that, that Burl Ives, Robert Ryan, Tina Louise, who is still with us, and, and my my buddy uh, uh, Nehemiah Persoff, Nikki. Oh, Nikki. What, a, what a what a lovely guy he was. Yeah, I worked with Nikki several times after that too, yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah. we just lost him. Uh, yeah, yeah. He had a good hundred year. Yeah, hundred and two. Yeah, hundred and two. Yeah. He yeah. called me uh, two years ago. I had a blood clot, and I'm going to the office. He said, "Alan, you didn't call me for my birthday, and are you okay?" So I said, "Well, I'm going in this doctor's office. I'll call you back." He said, "Are you okay? Are you all right?" And I said, "Fine, I'll call you back." I went in there laughing, and the woman behind the desk says, "What's? Why are you laughing?" I said, "I just had a hundred and one year old man reassure me about my health." <laughs> <laughs> Nikki uh, was Nikki was special. He was. Yeah, that whole cast up there, all those uh, Jack Lambert, you know, all all the villains. Right, and, right. And, the, my main memory uh, was David Nelson was in it. Uh, That's true. That's too right. it was one of his f uh, few uh, roles uh, off the the Ozzie and Harriet show, and uh, I love David. And and the first night we get up there and we're in the Bend Inn, and uh, I'm trying to go to sleep because I got to get up at 5:30 the next morning and go act, and. Uh, all night long outside, these girls screaming, Ricky, Ricky. <laughs> but it was David. <laughs> Ricky Nelson had come up to oh, be with yeah. his brother, uh. and the girls found out, uh, every girl in Bend, Oregon found out, and, <laughs> and stood out in the street all night long screaming, Ricky. Uh, <laughs> and I said later to Ricky Nelson, thanks a lot, you know. Uh, I didn't get any sleep yeah. because of you. Yeah. Um, but the, the other uh, thing I remember was Mr. De Toth, uh, Andre De Toth, who, who yeah. was, at that point, I thought every director was a Hungarian uh, yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with yeah. a heavy, yeah. because I worked with Curtis, and then I worked with De Toth. And De Toth, on top of that, had an eye patch and looked like a pirate, and, uh, but he was the exact opposite. Yeah. Of Mike Curtis, yeah. at least to me. Yeah, and he was so sweet, and uh, it it renewed my faith in in uh, Hungarian directors, I guess. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, Day of the Outlaw. Uh, my other favorite moment on that was in the bend. In my mom, who was overweight, and I got into the elevator, which was in this old hotel, and Burl Ives who probably weighed 450 pounds, <laughs> got on with us. And the doors closed, and we pushed the button, and the thing went <laughs> <laughs> And we both, all of us looked at one another, and Ives pushed the door open, stepped out, and said, sorry, my lady, the elevator is yours, like that, to my mom. Uh, he was a terrific guy. I also remember... We, we were there for Thanksgiving, and these crazy character actors, instead of having a turkey dinner, we were in the high school. They made a spaghetti banquet dinner. Jack dinner. Lambert and Elijah Cook and Dabs Greer. All those all crazy that. guys. Yeah. And, and uh, they, we had a spaghetti dinner, and, and Burl Ives got up and, and did about a half hour uh, singing, and Ricky Nelson got up and did a, about a half hour, too kept everyone in yeah it was yeah. pretty cool and the way west you uh, got to you got to you got to which uh, work is funny with. the way west was also part of it in fact uh, about half of it was filmed in bend oregon 
Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. We started in Eugene, and that was in 1966, the summer of 66, which was exactly eight. My friends, I, I gave them, it was eight years later, mm -hmm. and uh, I had a weird experience with Robert Mitchum uh, doing a, a scene on, we, I was on my mule and he was on his horse and we, we had a tracking shot across this prairie and I, for some reason I was having trouble with the dialogue and so I would blow it and we'd have to turn around and, and go all the way back across the prairie and the camera truck, the big crane would have to go all the way back and and I did this two or three times, and Mitch and finally said to me, he said, what the hell is wrong with you, Hoss? He called me a Hoss. And uh, I said, I don't know, I feel weird. I, f I feel a, a weird feeling, like I've been here before. Well, years later, just a couple of years ago, uh, if you look at the credit on Day of the Outlaw, mm -hmm. my credit on the screen, uh, Nikki Persoff and Robert Ryan are riding towards this town. Right. If you look at the scene between Mitchum and I, nine years later, in the summer. Same place? We're in the exact same spot. Wow. As Nikki and, wow. and Robert Ryan. Wow. Well, you had some firsts with Robert Ryan. Did you, <laughs> did you not? You, 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 would you yeah, mind sharing I was telling that one? Somebody, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I smoked my first marijuana cigarette with with Robert Mitchum, and uh, I've never had any since, of course. Uh, None of us have. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember it was it was so cool. He had somebody would would roll his his marijuana cigarettes. They mm -hmm. were like real cigarettes, and he mm -hmm. had them in a you know a regular mm -hmm. pouch. Uh, yeah, and really good. <laughs> good quality good stuff. Uh, <laughs> and I came home from that shoot and made the mistake of telling my parents that I had smoked marijuana with Robert Mitchum <laughs> and my father went through the roof you know telling me what are you doing that's illegal it's awful you know what are you doing and I, I was telling Alan you know 45 years later in the old people home with my my father he's telling all his friends bragging about the fact that I that he said Mike smoked marijuana with Robert Mitchell <laughs> <laughs> times they have changed <laughs> Robert yeah. Mitchum was as you well know because yeah. your book uh, it, it really goes into him pretty well but he's still an enigma uh, I was always fascinated by him um, I had a lot of scenes with Bob I had worked with his brother years before that, John, mm -hmm. on Riverboat, a series right. called Riverboat. So John and and Bob, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time with them when we were on location uh, off camera. And uh, it, Bob Mitchum was, I still can't figure him out. I mean, when I think yeah. about him, he was brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. He'd come into a scene and look, look at the script once yeah and jane jane greer told me the same thing yeah. when they were doing out of the past he'd come in in the morning hung over Never, in makeup yeah. and he'd say totally. what are the lyrics and he'd pick up the, script, the lyrics look at it. Yeah, what, are say, the what are the lyrics yeah. he'd sit there read it once toss it aside and it was there and be absolutely brilliant yeah on top of it yeah. so uh, um but we got along well and he was very very kind to me uh in a lot of ways um so, but uh, he, uh, I don't think anybody was ever got totally close to Bob Mitchum is what no. I, I would think. No, I think he, he, he protected himself. He, I had a friend near the end before he got real sick, went up and uh, my friend had someone that had been, I think a script girl or something that knew him well. And they went to the Biltmore up there near Santa Barbara and uh, you know uh, the guy came and uh, he said what do you want and Mitchum says I'll have the usual and my friend says well I'll have whatever Bob wants has so they put two tumblers of water down and my friend picks it up and it's pure vodka <laughs> and he said and he drank like three three of those to yeah lunch with to no effect and he said, where I screwed up was I made this comment, hey, you haven't been feeling well, shouldn't you take it a little easy on the booze? 
And that was, yeah, that you're was, done. He, he said, I've lived my life a certain way, and no producer, director, wife, or effing author is going to tell me <laughs> what I can or cannot do. And I said, that kind of killed the book thing. Totally. Yeah. 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 That yeah. sounds like Mitch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He, he was, um, only when he drank too much. Um, right. He, I mean, he would, he'd be fine most of the time with right. the alcohol. But I saw him a couple times uh, yeah. where he, he was really mean, uh, yeah. really mean to people. And, yeah. um, you know, that's... Yeah. Uh, but he, he was uh, but a great actor, a, a smart, really smart, well-read, wrote poetry, sang. Uh, he composed know. an oratorio that was performed at uh, the Hollywood Bowl under anonymously. Uh, really? I did not know this. Yeah, John yeah. told me that. John yeah. Mitchum told me that. Yeah. Uh, I dated his daughter uh, just a couple times, uh, Trina. And uh, I went, this was not the house in um, Montecito. It was when they still lived in Bel Air. Right. I went to pick her up. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and I was let in. And just off the main highway, I, I looked to my left, and there was this big uh, library, mm -hmm. you know, one of those two-story mm -hmm. libraries with the, the ladder and the, all the books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was waiting for Trina and just sort of checking out the books in the library. And she came in. She said, I'm sorry, I'm, I made you wait. And I said, that's OK. I said, wow, what a great library. Yeah. And she said, this is my dad's. Yeah. He's read everything in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he wouldn't let anybody know something like that. Mm -hmm. But he was incredibly read. Uh, yeah. 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 So what were your feelings when you look, as you look back on your career? And I mean, you've done uh, the, uh, I know at the top it was mentioned the Ruby and Oswald thing you did with your dad. I know you're rightfully very proud of that. The stuff with Kurt Russell. Uh, all the stuff you've done both in front and behind the camera. What what were your thoughts when you... And, and how long had it had been since you had seen this this episode? Well, yeah, I hadn't seen I hadn't seen this for years. I deliberately watched it about a week ago. Sure, sure. So I'd be ready for this. Yeah. Uh, but it was much, much more fun watching it Absolutely. here. Um, uh, you know, I guess my initial thought is, I'm still here and everybody's gone. <laughs> but it's only because I was so young. Uh, you know, it's sad that all these people uh, are no longer with us. I would it love is. to have had Jack sitting here with us because he would have given given us even more insight into oh, yeah. the Steve Lalo character. Um, right. I can remember him at one time, we were having lunch together. This just came to me now. And he just went into a, a, a spiel about his character. Mm -hmm. For me, it was about about his character mm -hmm. and and what what I should know as my character about him. And uh, that's the way Jack was. He would just sort of <laughs> he made it easy, but he he'd do it without you know. Um, mm -hmm any trouble but he that probably added to our relationship i think yeah. in on film well i'll tell you michael um jack's not here and they're all gone but you're still with us and i can't tell you how much i've enjoyed this and i think thank the you. audience have enjoyed this thank put you put it together for michael mcgreevy please thank you michael thank you and the next the next uh the next episode with diane carroll uh abram guineas Another blacklisted writer was uh, another writer of, of this show, and this is another tremendous episode, so I hope you stick around. And thank you for coming out tonight, and thank Michael again. Thank, thank you. you.